Hi everybody, today I thought we'd have a look at uh, designing and building a small frequency reference standard that you could use for checking the calibration of frequency counters, oscilloscopes and other uh, test equipment devices. And to do that I'm going to employ a small little uh, GPS module that you can quite easily obtain on eBay these days. Now these little modules are very good. They actually have on board a a crystal oscillator that is locked into the uh, satellite reference once they have a fix on the satellites and normally th that oscillator is giving a little timing pulse coming out at 1 Hertz uh, by means of a little green LED so the intention was that uh, when you get a fix on a satellite with these modules the little green LED on the board starts flashing at 1 Hertz you know you have a fix. Now we don't want a frequency of 1 Hz, I want to try and generate a reference frequency of 10 MHz so we'll have to do some reprogramming on this device and I'll show you how that's done shortly. But the interesting thing is that these are quite stable once they're locked into a satellite. Uh, but there is some variations in the different modules and different types of these uh, little GPS devices. So I just want to point out first of all some of the requirements with regard to the type of module you need to look for and the differences between them. Right, well here we can see I've drawn out the layout of one of these small GPS modules on the board but before I go through the details of that I just want to point out the type of module you need to purchase for this project. Now the obvious ones you see on eBay are the Ublox Neo-6 module but unfortunately those modules are not suitable for our project today as we can only reprogram them to give a output frequency of a maximum of 1 kilohertz so clearly we're not going to achieve our 10 megahertz but uh, as luck would have it uh, Ublocks make a range of these modules the next generation the 7 series that's the Neo 7 are capable of giving frequencies up to 10 megahertz and then there's also the Neo 8 module which again is capable of giving that higher frequency. So let's just first of all have a look at the type of modules that you should be looking for for this project and I'll just point out the differences between them. Now this little table here is showing you some of the different variants of the uh, Ublox Neo module. Um, I did mention that the Neo 6 module which we normally see on eBay, that's normally the 6M is not suitable for our project today because that only gives a, a maximum frequency out uh, up to uh, 1 kilohertz. Uh, but they do do a 6T version but I've never seen one so uh, but I've just put it on here for completeness because the Neo 6T version uh, has a, a ROM on board which stores the configuration settings so once, it's, once that's programmed you can't change it. Uh, but it does have a uh, temperature controlled oscillator on the board and uh, that is quite useful but uh, as I said we probably won't see that one anywhere and I'll be using today the Neo 7 module that comes in two variants we have the 7M which is the one I'm using it has an internal ROM with the configuration settings and it has a normal crystal oscillator built on the board but there's also the Neo 7N uh, but that has a flash memory in the module and uh, that means that you can reprogram that and it remembers the reprogrammed configuration settings when the power is removed and furthermore it has a temperature controlled crystal oscillator on there which is very very stable uh, but the N version tends to be more expensive and sometimes more difficult to obtain. There is the version 8 now out which is the Neo M8 and that comes in three variants the M, the N and the Q and as you see here the only difference between that is the type of memory on the module and the type of oscillator used uh, and again you'll see that the N version is similar to the 7N version with the flash memory and the uh, temperature controlled oscillator whereas the other two versions the M and the Q simply have the ROM and the normal crystal oscillator. So basically what we'll be doing today is we'll be reprogramming the uh, Neo 7 module to give us 10 megahertz output uh, but because our module is going to be the M version with a ROM we'll use the external EEPROM to save the configuration settings. 
Well here we have a uh, typical module of one of these uh, GPS little units. Uh, in the centre you've got the U-Blocks Neo 7 in our case, we'll be using the Neo 7M. And the, remember the M version has got internal ROM with the configuration settings, so that's pre-programmed. Which means that we'll have to use the external EE PROM to store the change configuration settings because we're going to change the configuration of this module instead of giving us 1 hertz coming out of pin 3 there uh, driving that LED through a 1K resistor we're going to change the time impulse coming out to 10 megahertz see if we can get that uh, now what I will do is solder a, a small wire on there which we can then tap off to the rest of our circuitry to take that signal out and sometimes I find it's better to remove that resistor so you disconnect the LED from that time impulse just in case that has some effect on the shape of that time impulse coming out. In reality I find that the time impulse at the frequencies around 10 MHz is not particularly clean and we'll have a look at that later. Now the other point I'll mention is that the electrically alterable PROM there uh, normally uh, its memory is maintained when the power is removed from this module by a small supercapacitor there, 80 millifarad capacitor uh, and that capacitor normally charges up when the power is uh, connected through a resistor but uh, what I'm finding is that after the unit has been powered down for a few days or even a few hours uh, the supercapacitor discharges and therefore you lose the memory in the EEPROM so then you have to reconfigure it again so it's not ideal so what we're going to do is uh, on pin 22 of the U-Blox module here, that's the backup uh, power supply uh, pin, uh, which normally, as I say, goes to that supercapacitor. But we're going to solder a small piece of wire there and then tap off and feed through a blocking diode a little 3 volt supply using a small lithium button battery there, the CR2032. And that will maintain the memory in the EEPROM even when the power is... Uh, removed. So that's the, the other change we're going to make. Uh, the other points on the board is that uh, you've got a red LED there that's just coming on when the power is uh, connected. There you've got a 3.3 volt regulator and then uh, there's your antenna connection there coming out. There's the uh, few components there for the antenna feed and then sometimes you'll find that you've got some copper strips here which is the, an optional connection for uh, probably for an active antenna I would imagine. So there we have the uh, the basic module and as I say uh, the, the green areas there are showing you where we need to solder two wires onto the board to make the modifications we need. Right here we see a, a close-up of the module. I've uh, just removed that 1k resistor that was there next to the LED and you can see the two solder pads there. I just need to clean that up with some solder braid. And on the other side of the board, you see there we've got a resistor and uh, the diode. And I need to solder a wire on there just to uh, give us access to the uh, pin 22 on the uh, U-Blocks module uh, for the battery backup. So let me just clean up the, uh, the tabs there. Just use some solder braid to clean them up. Let me just put some solder on that pad. There you go. I'm just going to solder some uh, fine wire. I'm using a 33 gauge copper wire here which I've uh, cleaned and tinned the end. And uh, I'm just going to tack it onto that pad that I just put some solder on. Uh, you need a, a very fine tipped iron for this. There we go. Next thing I'm going to do is just solder some wire onto where we need the backup battery to go, which is on that resistor side there. Just put a bit of solder there first of all. I've got some fine wire which I've already tinned. There we go. So we now got the, the two wires on. Um, the 
copper wire there is for the uh, the pulls out and then the grey wire there I've got which is going to go to the 3 volt battery backup. Right, well here we have a basic block diagram of our project today. Uh, as, as I say the heart of it is going to be the GPS module there. Now we're going to reconfigure uh, that particular module so we have a 10 MHz time impulse coming out and that is then going to be fed through a 10 nanofarad capacitor with Schmidt trigger to clean up that pulse. In reality the pulse coming out at that frequency is quite noisy. Uh, if you go lower in frequency it's a much cleaner pulse but at 10 MHz it tends to be a very noisy signal coming out so we'll try and clean that up with the Schmidt trigger there and for this particular purpose I'm going to be using the 74AC14 chip which is a CMOS version of the 74AC14 and it also is a faster switching time as well. Um, but if you can't get hold of the 74AC uh, series you can still use the 74HC 14IC instead. Now one thing I didn't mention earlier is that not only can we alter the configuration of the GPS module for 10 MHz coming out when it's locked onto a satellite but if it's not locked on a satellite normally you get no time impulse coming out but we're going to reprogram the configuration on this module so we still get a 10 MHz frequency coming out of it even though it's not locked onto a satellite and the only difference will be that if you're not locked on the accuracy of the oscillator output will not be as accurate as uh, if it was locked on but at least you'll still have a signal that you can use. So the output coming from the GPS module will always give you a 10 MHz signal either locked or not. It's then fed into a group of divide by 10 uh, network here and for that I'll be using the 74HC390 chip. That particular IC has got two divide by 10 networks built in it so we'll only need three chips for this particular circuit. It's a very versatile IC because you can program that IC by altering the pin connections on it to give you many combinations of divide by and uh, that's something that we could probably look at in f future projects as well. So the output coming from this then is going to give us um, 10 megahertz through another Schmidt tree coming straight out from the uh, GPS module basically. Uh, we then have 1 megahertz, 100 kilohertz, 10 kilohertz, 1 kilohertz and 100 hertz which is divided down and the last divider network here is going to give us a 10 hertz signal that I'm going to use to flash a green LED which simply is telling us that we're getting an output from the oscillator on the board that's all. Now the whole of this is going to be powered from a simple 5 volt regulator IC uh, and the other thing I'm going to have to do is because we're now going to use the 10 megahertz signal either locked or not locked we need some means of telling the user when the signal output is locked and accurate or when it's free running at 10 MHz. And for that I'm going to use a little Arduino Nano there driving a liquid crystal display. And all we're going to do is have a very simple bit of software there and it's going to just monitor when the GPS module is locked onto some satellites. If it is locked onto some satellites it's then going to give a reading out on the display. I'll probably indicate the number of satellites it's locked onto uh, and that gives us a fix that it's on the satellite and then it'll tell us we've got 10 megahertz coming out it'll either say it's locked or it's not locked and uh, that will be the indication of what the signal is coming out of there. So basically this is our little uh, project today Right, we'll just have a quick look at the schematic for the project today. Uh, the output coming from the GPS module, as we say, going through the capacitor, through the Schmidt trigger there, which squares it off, and a second Schmidt trigger before going to a uh, two 100 ohm resistors in parallel. That's giving us 50 ohms output impedance on the output there for 10 megahertz. The 10 megahertz signal is then fed into the first uh, divider in the chain there. Remember these uh, are both these dividers are in one chip so that the U2A and U2B are in the 74HC390 IC and you've got another pair there and another pair there and I've just indicated here the uh, pin connections and the configuration so you can use it as a divide by 10. So you see here we've got pins 1 and 7 joined together and 9 and 15 joined together um, that's providing us the configuration for the divide by 10 in each of those 
and then the input's going in on pin 4, the output from the first divide by 10 is coming out at pin 3, going into the next divide by 10 input at 12, and the output of that is coming at pin 13. Now the other important thing with the configuration of these uh, divide by 10 ICs is you have to take pins 2 and 14 to ground. Uh, they're the reset pins, but you want to have them uh, set to ground. The normal earth return for the chip is pin 8, and the power supply to the IC is pin 16. And that's repeated for the next pair and the next pair there. We also have a uh, 100 nanofarad capacitor, 0.1 capacitor there, decoupling each of those ICs, as we do with the 74AC14 IC at the top there. Now the output from the GPS module is feeding the Arduino Nano and I'm only using three wires to do that. I'm just using the TX output from the uh, GPS module feeding data pin 3 on the Nano and then VCC is going to the 5 volt pin on the Nano and the ground is going to the ground pin on the Nano. And then I've got a little connection socket uh, connecting to ground, TX and RX of the GPS module and that's going to some pins that I can then couple up a USB to TTL uh, adapter for programming the uh, GPS module. And I'll show you that later. The output of the Arduino is simply driving the liquid crystal display. And I'm showing you there the data pins that I'm using on the Nano and how it's connected to the LCD display there. It's uh, quite conventional. We've seen that many times before. Uh, there you have the little uh, 10K trimmer. Uh, which is actually setting the contrast level on the display and you have a backlight on this display so I have a 220 ohm resistor going up to the 5 volt supply and then the cathode of that going to ground. The 5 volt regulator, a simple setup there, I have a 470 microfarad capacitor on the input, uh, a point one at either side of the input and output and then finally a 100 microfarad on the output of the regulator. The uh, green LED there uh, is simply connected to the output of the last divide by 10 network and that's going to ground through a 120 ohm limiting resistor, limiting the current through the LED. And I'm using a low current LED there for, for that purpose. And then finally, remember we have our 3 volt backup, our little uh, lithium uh, button battery there, which is coupled via a small diode to the backup supply on the GPS module to ensure that when we've removed the power we still maintain the uh, configuration that's stored in the uh, memory. So that's basically it. Uh, I haven't done anything at the moment on the outputs of these uh, divider networks here but we may on the final project add some extra uh, Schmidt triggers on there and then obviously we may do something also in, in terms of terminating the output so we've got 50 ohm output as well. But for the moment I think we'll try and build this on a breadboard. What I have done though is make, made a small little PCB to mount all the uh, divide by 10 ICs on because if you don't do that at this sort of frequencies and you start hooking that on a breadboard you get so much noise it, it doesn't really work very well. So you'll see I've made a small temporary PCB to handle that. So let's now go and assemble all this onto the breadboard and test it and just see how it uh, works. Here we have all the uh, components I've put together on the breadboard here. As I mentioned I've made up a, a temporary printed circuit board here for the uh, divide by 10 network. So there you've got the three 74HC390 ICs. And I've also mounted the 5 volt regulator on that board as well. And uh, at this end you've got the LED and the... Uh, current limiting resistor. Note also I have the 0.1 microfarad capacitors there decoupling each of those chips as close as possible to the IC. So the input to that is this uh, grey wire here which is going down and there, we, there we've got the uh, 0 0.01 microfarad capacitor which is feeding the first Schmidt trigger here. There's the uh, 74AC14 IC which is actually uh, uh, hex uh, Schmidt trigger, so the six uh, Schmidt triggers in there. At the moment I'm only using one of them uh, just to uh, test the circuit. There's the Arduino Nano which is coupled to the liquid crystal display 
uh, via the data ports there and uh, there's the uh, resistor which is feeding the uh, backlight display for the LCD. On this side here we have the 10 kilo ohm uh, trim port which is adjusting the contrast for the display and then finally here you can see we've got the GPS module uh, with its antenna uh, connected at the moment and there's the backup battery coupled in via the small little diode there. Now uh, the output, the time impulse output coming through this very fine wire there is coupling onto the 0.01 uh, capacitor. Now the other thing we've had to do, because we need to, to reprogram the uh, GPS module, uh, you can see I've got some flying leads here plugged into the uh, the RX and TX and ground pin of the uh, GPS module and that's going to this uh, USB to uh, TTL uh, adapter here. That will plug into the PC and we'll then reprogram the uh, GPS module. So that's basically it, that's all the components. Well, the other thing I've done is that I've got a, a standard battery connector here uh, but uh, instead of using a small little 9 volt battery I've decided to use uh, six uh, AA 1.5 volt cells in a little pack here which is uh, coupled with the same pin connection as you see there as you would have on a, on a standard little 9 volt battery. So I think the next thing we'll do now we'll uh, just uh, hook this up and uh, just see how it responds. Here you see I've got the breadboard now hooked up with all the components to the uh, PC ready to program the uh, Neo 7 module here uh, and that's connected using the uh, UART Universal Asynchronous Receiver Transmitter uh, which is a USB to TTL converter. Uh, this particular one I'm using uses the CP2102 chip. Uh, so that's what's going to be used to uh, reconfigure the uh, little module, the GPS module here, the Neo 7. Uh, also you'll notice on the breadboard now I've added the two 100 ohm resistors in parallel on the output of the last Schmidt trigger. That's to give us a 50 ohm output impedance and you can see there I've hooked on the oscilloscope and a frequency counter probe at that point so we can monitor that. You can probably see the display, it's currently showing no signal. It does say 10 MHz unlocked on it at the moment but uh, I haven't yet set the, uh, the, the GPS module here for free running at 10 MHz so we need to do that next. So I think the next thing we'll do is we will uh, reconfigure the GPS module now to, to give us a 10 MHz signal which is free running and also 10 MHz locked to the GPS signal when it's on the uh, satellites. Now to configure the uh, GPS module with the Neo 7 on you need to go to the uh, uBlocks website and download some evaluation software uh, to allow you to reset the frequency of the timing pulse. Um, I'll give you the web address for this with a link below so you can go to it and download the software and install it on your computer. Uh, basically when you're on this page if you just scroll down uh, you will see that uh, there you have the option to download the U Center for Windows version 8.2 it's a zip file so you need to download that uh, zip file and then uh, unzip the uh, the file and then install that software on your computer and then we can run the uh, uCenter software to uh, reset the frequency of the timing pulse. Right, well, once you've got the software installed when you start the program this is the screen you'll get and the first thing to check is that the uh, your USB to TTL adapter is uh, connected and communicating and if you look at the side there you'll see there's two little green bars if it's connected. If they're not green it's not connected but if you just click on the uh, little down arrow there it'll tell you there, look you see it's highlighted that COM port 7 has got a dot against it which means it's connected to COM port 7 which is where I've got the uh, the USB to TTL converter. 
Uh, if you find that the disconnect uh, is a dot against it, then you need to set it onto the whichever COM port on your computer. It may not be COM port 7, it could be any COM port number on your computer. But at least the, uh, the green indicator, if I just click on that, you can see it's disconnected now. Uh, and uh, if I just dot the, you see that it's got disconnected. Uh, to to reconnect it, I can either press on where it says COM port seven in my case, or click on the two little bars there, and you see it's now closed and turned green. So once you've got the uh, communication established between the uh, USB to TTL adapter, we can now communicate with the GPS module, and the next thing you need to do is go to the view um, drop down menu there so if we click on that and we're looking for configuration view so what we'll do now is that we will click on the configuration view and that will bring up the configuration window and once you're on that window you need to just scroll scroll the bar down here and look for the timing pulse in our case we're looking for TP5 in brackets time pulse 5 so if you click on that it then brings up another screen and this will allow us now to change the setting. Now we'll make sure that the time pulse setting there is set at 0 dash time pulse usually by default that will be the case and the uh, button there below the active button is ticked so that needs to remain ticked the uh, radio button there period has the dot in it at the moment but we're going to change that shortly and then you have the period there, uh, this is the period of the frequency when it's not locked onto the satellite. It's currently set at, uh, it says there, a million microseconds, which is one hertz. And then the length of that pulse is zero, so there's no pulse effectively there. Uh, the two buttons here are ticked, so the lock to GNSS and the other setting in GNSS, both those are ticked and they remain, they should be remain ticked for our purposes. The sync button, just uh, ignore that, that can be left unticked. Then the next area here we've got the period lock. This is going to be the period or the frequency that we get when it's locked onto the satellite. At the moment it's set at uh, a million uh, microseconds, one hertz, and the length of that pulse is set at, looks like it's a hundred uh, microseconds. The alignment pulse uh, box needs to be ticked, so that remains ticked. And the other settings below here, we just leave them as they are. Now the first thing we're going to do is we're going to uh, click the frequency uh, radio button there. So we, if we click on that, it moves from period to frequency. And you can now see in the boxes here it's showing hertz as opposed to time. And we're going to click the duty cycle box as opposed to length. So we do that, and now we get a percentage. So what we see there at the moment is that we have 1 hertz with zero duty cycle when uh, we're not locked onto a satellite. And when we're locked onto a satellite we've got 1 hertz uh, at the moment it's showing there a duty cycle of a 100,000%. Uh, that's obviously not right. That's from the previous setting. But we're going to change those anyway. So the first thing we're going to do is change the top uh, 1 hertz frequency there to uh, 10 megahertz. So that's uh, 1 Zero, 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 zero. So that's 10 megahertz, and we're going to make the duty cycle 50%. So that sets the frequency at 10 megahertz at a duty cycle of 50% when we're not locked onto a satellite. Then we come down to the next uh, frequency box there, and we're going to set that also to 10 megahertz. So we set that to 10, zero, 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 10 megahertz and the uh, duty cycle wants to be set at 50%. So there you can see now we've set the frequency to 10 MHz with a duty cycle of 50%, uh, either when it's free running and not locked onto a satellite, and then when it's lo locked onto the satellite uh, we still want the 10 MHz time impulse coming out. So that's now set, and to uh, send that information now to the GPS module we simply click on the send button there at the bottom you see. So let's just do that. So we click on the send. 
So that information has now been sent to the GPS module, so it should now be running at 10 MHz. The final thing we need to do is go to the receiver uh, heading at the top there and go for the drop down menu. So we click on the receiver, we get a drop down menu, and we want to go down to where it says action, and you get another drop down list there, and one of them says save config. So you need to press on the save config. So that information now is saved in the uh, EE prom on the uh, GPS module. So uh, that will maintain that setting as long as you have the uh, the backup battery. Here we see now I have the uh, breadboard connected to the uh, oscilloscope and the frequency counter. I've got the leads connected at the moment to the 10 megahertz output, and as you'll see the. Uh, waveform of the 10 MHz signal is not particularly clean uh, it's a little bit noisy and uh, it's got a bit of jitter on there as you see uh, this is mainly due to the fact that they're trying to generate this 10 MHz from a 48 MHz uh, frequency which is not easily dividable down to 10 so you we're getting some of this uh, distortion uh, but as you'll see as we go through the divider chain that should clean up and give us a reasonably good square wave uh, having said that, the uh, frequency itself is pretty accurate. Uh, it's free running at the moment, we're not locked onto a satellite, and uh, we're getting 10 MHz uh, coming out. So, as a timing signal, it's still very good at 10 MHz. So, what I'll do now, I'll uh, move down and we'll check the output at the different uh, levels. So I'll go down now and check the divider network down at 1 MHz and just have a look at the waveform and uh, check the frequency. Uh, you can see at the moment, looking at the frequency counter, it's giving us a frequency of uh, exactly 10 megahertz, 10 point, all the zeros there, so pretty good at that. Right, well I'm now connected to the uh, 1 megahertz output, and uh, you can see that the square wave now is much cleaner. You've got a little bit of noise on top and bottom, but uh, certainly the uh, leading and trailing edge is, is very, very clean and uh, we're getting a frequency shown on the oscilloscope of uh, exactly 1 MHz and as you see here the frequency counter is giving us a frequency of virtually exactly 1 MHz so, and that's free running so it's very very good actually. So let's move down and have a look at the uh, 100 kilohertz uh, signal. Right well there we have uh, 100 kilohertz and as you see the square wave is getting even better now and uh, you still get a little bit of noise top and bottom Frequency is exactly 100 kilohertz, and you can see here on the frequency counter, we've got exactly 100 kilohertz. So let's have a look at the uh, next level down. So let's check the 10 kilohertz. Right, we're now down looking at uh, 10 kilohertz. Again, there's the uh, reasonably nice square wave coming out. It's showing exactly 10 kilohertz on the oscilloscope, and again the frequency counter is showing us virtually exactly 10 kilohertz. So again, that's very very good. So let's check the 1 kilohertz. We're now down at uh, 1 kilohertz. Again, the square wave still looks reasonably good, and the oscilloscope is showing us a frequency of uh, exactly 1 kilohertz. And the frequency counter is showing us a frequency of 1000 hertz, which is exactly 1 kilohertz. So, again, happy with that. So, finally, let's check the 100 hertz output. Here we see the uh, 100 hertz output. Uh, square wave still looks quite good. A little bit more noise now, top and bottom, probably because we're nearer the mains frequency. Uh, but still, the frequency is accurate at 100 hertz. And again, the uh, frequency counter is giving us a reading of exactly 100 hertz. So again, very good. So I think overall. Uh, Apart from the 10 megahertz at the input where we had that distortion on the square wave, I think overall the divider chain is giving a reasonably good square wave coming out. And uh, certainly the accuracy of the frequency is good enough as uh, a reference standard. Here we can see the, uh, the breadboard now. Uh, and I just want to point out the display. Now that we're locked onto a satellite, you can see there that it's telling us the number of satellites were locked onto, in this case 7, and it now is reading that the 10 MHz frequency is locked. Now what I find is that uh, putting some sort of a 
metal shield. In this case I've got a printed circuit board copper there underneath the uh, antenna there for the GPS module. I find that improves the reception of the antenna. Uh, so if we actually mount it on some metal or some uh, copper then uh, we can improve that. So we can look at that later. Um, and maybe look at other means of putting a different type of antenna onto this particular module. But this one seems to work quite well at the moment. Uh, depending on your locality and whether you're indoors or what the screening is like, uh, you might have issues with the reception. What I have found is that if you're in a bad reception area and you're not able to get a good uh, fix on the satellites, uh, reducing the frequency of the uh, module from 10 megahertz down to 1 megahertz. Uh, you'll find that it locks onto satellites much quicker. Uh, but that obviously means that the divider 10 network coming out will then all have gone down in frequency. But still you've got uh, some accurate frequencies that you can use uh, locked into the uh, satellite. There you'll see I've just lost a couple of satellites there. We're now down to five. Up at six again. So really the signal level from this antenna depends on where you position the GPS module and as I say that's something that we need to maybe consider uh, later on this project. Right, well I just thought I'd show you this uh, we're currently locked onto a, uh, a satellite fix uh, I'm detecting five satellites at the moment and uh, I've just got the oscilloscope hooked up to the one megahertz output from my divider network on the breadboard there and you'll see that on the top of the uh, square wave and a little bit on the bottom we've got some noise, some frequency noise uh, and I'm finding that I, I get that noise only when it's locked onto a satellite. Uh, it's only very small and uh, it doesn't seem to detract from the actual accuracy of the frequency. The frequency is still giving us an output at exactly uh, 1 megahertz. So um, if you can put up with a little bit of noise there, uh, I think as a, as a frequency reference standard uh, for checking frequency counters or oscilloscopes, I think it's uh, accurate enough for that and uh, the noise doesn't seem to detract from the accuracy of the, uh, of the signal. Well that concludes part one of this little project on this uh, frequency standard using a uh, GPS uh, module seems to work quite well. We got a little bit of noise on the square wave but at least the accuracy of the frequency is very good and certainly could be used as a calibration check for oscilloscopes or a frequency counter. Um, what we may do in part two of this, obviously we need to clean it up. Uh, I'll look at designing a printed circuit board and we'll look at maybe some way of doing some switching on the output frequencies for the uh, divider network chain that we had. Uh, so that will give us then one socket and we can hopefully switch between the different frequencies. Um, and we'll probably have a look at some other improvements. We may add some more Schmidt triggers there to clean up the waveform. But uh, let's have a look at that in part two of the project. But for the time being, I hope you found this uh, of interest. I will put a couple of links down below. Uh, one for downloading the software from uh, Ublox for the, to, to reset the configuration. Also I'll give you the uh, little bit of code for the Arduino uh, that drives the display and uh, I'll try and draw up a little circuit diagram and add that as well. But for the time being, uh, thanks for watching. If you found this of interest please give me a thumbs up and I'll see you all again soon next time. Bye for now.